Go. All right. All right, guys. Welcome back to another episode of the, of the Black Dog Sports Podcast. It's going to be our segment from the dog's mouth. Today we have um, former Bulldog great and Philadelphia Eagle, Jamar Chaney. How's it going, Chaney? It's going pretty good, man. How y'all doing? Doing all right. I guess everybody else, some people still connecting. So we'll go ahead and just get everything popping. We already had you waiting a little bit. So we'll kind of just start off, uh, I guess, we normally start off with how did you become a dog? But in a sense, you became a dog with a Georgia Bulldog to start out. So uh, yeah. first talk about, I guess, committing to Georgia and then kind of finding out that you can't, you couldn't enroll there. Yeah, when I committed to Georgia, uh, I think around December, early December or something like that, you know, I was committed to them pretty much the whole time. Uh, signed with them. And didn't find out like I couldn't come until like I had already pretty much graduated. So I mean, it was kind of late. So man, it's just a uh, crazy thing. I mean, my uncle, I ain't know nothing about Mississippi State. Uh, only thing I ever knew about Mississippi State was I knew they played. Only game I ever saw them play was when they played. Uh, I think Texas and them in a in a, a game that was snowing or something like that. Just the but, snowball. Uh, yeah, but that's the only <laughs> game I ever saw them and stuff like that. So. Uh, my uncle saw a special on the Vesta Croom, then he reached out to, uh, once they, once Georgia, because they tried to keep getting me in, then once they f finally figured out they couldn't get me in, my uncle reached out to Mark Rick and told him to contact Sylvester Croom, and that's how the connection, uh, that's how the connection happened. So talk about, I mean, we've talked before about you kind of like how it ended up where you decided to come to state, even though, I mean, State one is actually really that good around there. I'm sure you wanted to play for a contender, but talk about that process. I don't know, I think you said you went to some other schools, but talk about how you ended up kind of like, I think you said, you know, it's probably God kind of telling you to come to Mississippi State, just how it, how it all kind of went down. Yeah, so how I ended up at State is, uh, like, I they let me start my whole recruiting process over, so I took some more visits. So I went to Rutgers, I went to uh, Maryland, went to NC State, then I went right to Mississippi State. So I went to all these schools back to back uh, on official visits. And, uh, I had a good time on all of them, but man, I ain't gonna lie now. The the worst visit, and it ain't, it ain't because it ain't the coaches or the players on the team, like none of that. Now I'm just talking about like like me being from Florida and coming to Mississippi. Man, it that was a different atmosphere for me. It was like it was through, out of the four visits, it was worth one. <laughs> my phone, my phone didn't work. None of that, uh, you know, private airports and all that stuff right there, man. And, and trying to get there, uh, the connection flights. But when I when I left Mississippi uh, State, I had because when I went to these schools, I had to talk to these the presidents too. So I had to talk to the president of Mississippi State and Rutgers and all that. Now Rutgers was gonna let me in, but Rutgers wasn't big in a big conference, so it was like, uh, but so when I left Mississippi State to get back on the plane to go home, I mean I just said a prayer. I said, man, God, whatever whichever school you want me to go to, you gotta eliminate the rest of them because right now it's gonna either be Maryland or NC State. And once I got off the plane, I had a voicemail from Maryland and NC State saying they couldn't, uh, they president was going to let me in. So I went to Mississippi State. And that's how I have them. That's crazy, well, man. I, Just, well, go ahead. Well, go ahead I, have, I have a question about that. Why did Maryland and, and that other school say they couldn't let you in? Was it the same reason because of Georgia? What Georgia said? Yeah, it was, they were saying academic events, honesty, and things like that. And I don't know the, the history of the program and stuff, but I guess. Most of the schools out there had been on academic probation when I got there. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess they were they ain't really going into details. Like once they they let me know they could, they weren't gonna be able to let me uh, get in. Right. Well, I want to talk more about if you don't mind um, the incident with Georgia coming out of high school because you know you had a two point nine GPA as I'm reading and it says you made a twelve sixty on the SAT. Now myself, I had a high GPA, but I sucked at standardized tests. So how did that make you feel, them doubting you making that score? Basically, kind of, I mean, I don't want to say they called you a cheater, but it kind of made you, that, that's, that would have sucked my intelligence. How did that make you feel? I mean, it was tough at the time, uh, just because that, the proof that they was giving us, I mean, like they, they showed me the scene chart and they, they kind of tried to tell me the person that I cheated off of. And it was kind of like I was sitting like, three rows, uh, three seats behind, all the way in the next row. So it's kind of like how you see somebody paper from that far. And and just all the details weren't lining up. And now we we uh, 
gave them like all the tutoring I was being, all the log in and log out I was doing uh, after school and things like that for the SAT and uh, mm -hmm. ACT and things like that. But they was telling me I could have fought it and won, but they were saying like I would have had to miss my freshman year. So I would probably run and roll into a school in, uh, until January. I didn't wow. Do that. Wait, so I just said, bump it, man. I'm going to find some ways to go. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to speak for our Bulldog fans. We're glad that you ended up here. Um, to me, that just – that just seems like such an unfair situation for institutions to try to say that you can't make a score on a t standardized test that you can take preps for just because you had a 2.9 a 2.9 GPA is not a bad GPA. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's not a bad GPA. So that, that kind of bothers me because I didn't know about this until Jeremiah – brought it up. I was like, what? So yeah. I researched it. I know if I was sitting in your shoes, I would definitely have been upset. But we're glad we got you in my room. Go ahead, Jay. All right. All right, let's move on. Uh so Cheney, let's talk about getting to Mississippi State and just getting a chance just to play early on. Yeah, well I got there, like I said, I got to Mississippi State uh probably a day before we started like the first team meeting going to the training camp. And no matter where I went, in, I mean, I, of course, I mean, it's great players everywhere, but I had always had the mindset that I wanted to come in and play. I mean, I ain't think too many linebackers was, you know, fast and athletic as me. So I, I knew I had to get strong and things like that. And I know I didn't go through the whole off-season program as far as, like, you know, prepping up to the season. But when I got there, I mean, they gave me an opportunity uh, to get out there, get on the field a little bit, show them what I can do in practice and things like that. And, uh that's what happened. I mean, they just saw the playmaking ability and things like that. I ain't start off, you know, starting, but probably by like the, I guess the, the third or fourth game, I ended up uh, starting. So uh, I just went in there with the mindset. I mean, I have, I know sometimes. I mean, I it ain't it ain't catch me, but it know it catch some people. Man, when I got to college, you know, through my whole college career, it was like, man, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I put all my eggs in one basket. It was like, hey, I'm going to, <laughs> to go to Mississippi State to get to this, uh, to get to the NFL, man, to uh, get to the next level. So. Anything that came into that, in 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 a way of that, I mean, I pretty much put it to the side. So, all right. So I kind of wanted to dive into. I kind of talked to Timmy Byers about this last week. I mean, being a Florida boy, I mean, people say there's a difference of cats coming from. Even though Mississippi produced a lot of NFL talent, sometimes it seems like the mentality is a little different between like Mississippi players and Florida boys. Did you kind of notice that even when you? Because I mean, of course, you played Florida football, so you've seen the caliber of talent and just the mentality of the guys. Did you? Notice a big difference even when you came to Mississippi State. I mean, obviously the school was still trying to turn it around, but did you notice like a difference in just how the guys like I won't say behave, but like their mentality as far as how they approach the game? Yeah, one thing about uh, the Florida got a lot of talent. That's one thing, and, and, and like it's it, it's speed, but it's like a lot of raw talent. Mississippi State, Mississippi got a lot of raw talent too, but I mean, if football is so big in, in Florida, and it's just like you competing. You know, all the way when you kids, man, you, you got kids starting five years old playing football, and it's just mm -hmm. like, it's just a mindset. That's what we're going to do. We're going to play football, and you're playing all all day, every day in the streets and things like that. So, I mean, that's the mm -hmm. mentality. But one thing I, I can say about, you know, playing with Miss, uh, Mississippi Cats, and, and kind of a little bit from different from Florida Cats, is, you know, Florida is highly, a highly recruited state, you know, so all the colleges flock there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, they can – that can get to a kid's head, you know, you might, you think he all that, or he think he is that. One thing about the cats from, uh, you know, playing with cats from Mississippi, Mississippi, like, they hungry, they feel like they're the underdog, and they, they like, they mm -hmm. grind, you know, on a different level, like, hey, they ain't looking for you to give them nothing, or you to uh, hand them nothing, man, they gonna grind for pretty much everything they gonna get, and they grind with that underdog mentality. It's funny you say that, because I know a lot of us, we always joke that the best players that went to Mississippi State and came from the little small schools, like, them. Bigger schools haven't reduced some of the best players all the time. Now, a couple of them panned out, but most of them that's not the case. So let's move on a little bit to, I mean, obviously that junior year, y'all didn't do great. So let's move on a little bit. I mean, that first year, I mean, uh, let's move on to like your second year, getting a chance to start. I was there kind of getting a chance to start at that wheel linebacker and um, starting that whole season. It was good, man. I got uh, got a chance to play next to uh, Quinn Coverson, man. He taught me a lot. Uh, you know, Dale Juan Robinson, those guys, I mean, took me under their wing mm -hmm. and we had a real good defense. It's just we, uh, I mean, we we couldn't we couldn't put no points on the board, so it's kind of. Like, <laughs> first, I mean, we we got after it, but I mean, you know, in the SEC, I mean, you can hold people all you want to, but eventually, you know, it's gone. You got to put some points on the board, you know, and uh, 
like I said, we 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 can we can, we we held our own for as much as we can, maybe. But then you know, after a while, you gotta you know put some points on the board, and that was that was the toughest thing we had to you know to deal with. I think because I mean, defensively, I think me personally, I think we was pretty good. You know, yeah, a couple of. You yeah, you're right. A couple of y'all ended up in the league, so I mean, I think it, obviously the talent was there. So. so, oh yeah, oh yeah, a lot of talent, a lot of talent. Them guys, I like I said, man, the D line was was real good. My sophomore year, like I said, with Dale One and uh, Mike Hurd and uh, Antoine Powell. I mean, it was a, a lot of them guys on there. Right. Willie Evans. I mean, boy, Titus Brown. I mean, hey, we yeah. we can't. Yeah. Yeah, but hey, once you once you uh. You got to put them for you. Keep that defense out there. You get get wore down, man. And, and in the SEC, SEC West, you playing against big dogs. You know? <laughs> uh, I know with that year, I remember Dale Moore told us y'all had to. I don't know if you was part of that group. Had to have a conversation with Tony Burks that year because he was supposed to be one of those guys that was uh helping y'all put points on the board. So I remember he told us that y'all had to have a conversation with him about that. Like I said, I don't know if you were part of that group though, but he said that it had to be a conversation I had. So I kind of wanted to go just kind of breathe past on first year because obviously your, I think your last three years probably a little more impactful at State. Um, your junior year, obviously that was the turnaround year. Talk about the coaches kind of shifting you from that wheel linebacker to the middle linebacker. And I, I think, you know, people have always focused on your athleticism, but anybody that knows you knows you have a high football IQ. So talk about that shift going from like the wheel linebacker to the middle linebacker, kind of being a leader to defense and just, you know, being a quarterback out there. Yeah, you know, uh, like I said, Quentin uh, Colson had left, and they felt it was uh, right to put me there. And just having the knowledge of the defense, been playing and starting in it for uh, two years, mm -hmm. and being that uh, captain, you know, a guy that's doing it right on and off the field, and just the knowledge of the game and knowledge of, you know, what's going on, what the team is trying to do to you, and to help the guys, you know, around you, you know, understand what they got to do and improve their play as well. I mean, it was a big difference. I always like to play the, the mic a little more just because, I feel the Mike is the leader of the defense. He's the center of the defense, and uh, he's a sit he, nine times out of ten. He's a guy getting the signals from the sideline, from the coach, and trying to get the D line lined up and uh, making sure he's the coach on the field, pretty much on the defense side of the ball. So it was, it was a, I wouldn't say it was a big adjustment, just because I knew the defense, you know, and I knew mm -hmm. how hard I worked, and I was confident in my ability. So it wasn't a big adjustment, but like I said, it was, it was a uh, something I look forward to doing. So. That particular year, y'all kind of, of course, turned it around. It was, you know, a couple years with Chrome. You know, they had to strip the team down and kind of rebuild it. Then that year, y'all kind of started to turn around and kind of started winning. So at what point in that season did you know that, you know, this might be a year that we're going to kind of make that bowl game, kind of start uh, make, making that shift toward being a legitimate program? Did y'all, was it a certain point of the season, or did y'all really know maybe before the season? Uh, you kind of know before the season. I mean, when you got young guys like me, you got Derrick McGee, you got Keith Fitz, you, you got you mm -hmm. got Anthony Dixon, you got a lot of guys that's uh that's producing at, at uh that's producing when they're freshmen and sophomores. You know, and mm -hmm. a lot of us played a lot. So once you get once these guys get more mature, you know what I'm saying? Like, and you put them all in the field at the same time, we think we can do special things. So, especially on the defensive side of the ball, like I mean, I think that year, pretty much every game we won. Probably outside is probably one. I can't remember the one that we scored on defense. You know, we scored a touchdown on the defense side of the ball in that game, pretty much every game we won. So it's like when you got guys like that, you know, Anthony Johnson, I mean, we, you just put all the pieces together of some really, really, really talented guys uh, work hard throughout the all offseason. And, and, and we was very confident going into that year. So we move on, kind of moving along that year. And y'all kind of start establishing yourself. People start talking about you. Then let's say we get to the old Miss game, and uh, I'm gonna see if I can find the, uh, that part on a particular screen. Let's see if I can. Oh, I can't screen share. Derek, can you go ahead and screen share the Shay Hodge hit? Hit. That's the only reason I can't screen share. Okay, Derek, do you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm looking for it. Okay. I got it. Okay. All right. Do, 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 do. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay, here we go. Uh, 
And what you think about that hit there? I mean, it was a big hit, man. Especially, I mean, it just – what make it bigger is, is the opponent and, like, you know, the score in the game and what happened after, you know, that, that play happened. That would make it a, a little bigger than what it was, you know. But, uh, you know, hats off the tires, you know, like I said, like we had some really good players, you know, him getting the pressure on the quarterback and things like that. But it just, you know, understanding the situation of the game and uh, knowing they had to go, what, it was 3rd and 14 or something like that. So, uh Understand the situation and, and trying to execute, but yeah, that was a big hit, man. Big uh, change in the game, and uh, that's what that's one to remember right there. And I'm real good friends with Shay too, so I mean, we talk about it <laughs> <laughs> every time we talk. We talk about it, so uh, he don't like to talk about it, man. So, but it is what it is. I think that play um, stopped them from it stopped their drive from getting the first down, and that led to us kicking the game with a field goal. Correct? Yeah. Then, yeah, 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 yeah. You right, yeah. So, I mean, your play, your hit, one basically set us up to win that game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, it was a lot of big plays in that game. It was back and forth. And, uh, like, we played pretty much horrible, I mean, the first three quarters of the game in that game. But uh, ended up putting up, I think, what, 17 points in the fourth quarter or something like that? 17-14 was <laughs> the I, final score. I forgot to put on our, I guess we were going to talk about, I guess at the end, uh, kind of like at the I think I did put it on there. At the end of that game, for Gies, you know, first we go to the first part of it. When Coach uh, O decided to go for it on fourth down, what were you thinking? Like, man, did he really just do this? Like, go <laughs> go for it on fourth down? Did y'all think that was like a challenge that he really was bold enough to go for it on fourth down when they had to leave? I mean, we didn't think it as a challenge. We, I mean, honestly, we thought, hey, this is our shot right here. We should stop right here. Hey. <laughs> yeah, they ain't got number 14 points. This is a two-score game. So, you know, he – uh. Hey, so go ahead and uh go ahead and go for it. This is our opportunity. Like I said, we uh that was the year we was pretty good. Uh, we really established ourselves on defense. So I mean, we look forward to that challenge. But we just looking for a it put our offense in a better chance. You know, to uh the execute and score a touchdown. I actually had a chance to ask Coach Ogeron about that, and he didn't really want to answer my question. He just looked at me, <laughs> and he rolled it. He was like, like, cause cause I cut me. You know, I, I do a little LSU stuff down here. So when I asked about that question, he said. Why are you asking about Mississippi State? And so I said, don't you see what color shirt I got on? You know, so he didn't want to answer that question about that game. <laughs> well, Coach, you know, want to talk about their biggest coaches. Man. <laughs> you think Pete you know, Carroll, Carroll want to hear about why he didn't give it to Marshawn Lynch? <laughs> if I meet Pete Carroll, I'm going to show ask him that question, too. And he'll be the same response. Oh. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, Jeremiah, they would be like asking um, K.J. Wright, what do you think about somebody from Mississippi making an interception to win the Super Bowl? Yeah. I, yeah did somebody I, actually I, did that? <laughs> yeah, I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's uh, move on to, obviously, uh, Pegues in that game and you know, returning the punt return. So the offense wasn't even getting the points. They ended up being Pegues. So, I mean, I, I was at the game, and some told me as soon as he the ball touched his hand, it was about to score the energy in the field on the field was just like that. So, did y'all know it as soon as the ball touched his hand that he was gonna take it to the house? Yeah, anytime he, I mean, he get a good look at it, he had a chance to take it to the, uh, take it to the house. But I think it was kind of like a line drive kick too, so it didn't even give. Mm-hmm. I remember that. It didn't even give. It was a bad point. It didn't even give his uh, the coverage team a chance to get down there, and he probably had a good fifteen yards or twenty yards before he even came close to a, a old Miss guy. So well, you kick you kick the ball like that to a returner like him. I mean. You pretty much ask for trouble. Yeah. And, I mean, and then, obviously, man, just moving on from the Ole Miss game and then y'all were able to win. I was there at that bowl game. I remember that because it was really cold. So I remember I think Tony did, like, a little reverse. It was real cold. I remember that's the main thing I remember about the game. It was really, really cold. Um, but, but Tony had a reverse, and then y'all ended up scoring. So talk about it just being able to get that first, first bowl victory. I think Mississippi State since, I want to say, 01 or 2000. It's been a while since they got a bowl victory. So I was that to kind of have that bowl victory, and people were kind of talking about y'all being that next team, I guess, on the rise. It was real big. Like I said, you you go through the whole offseason and things like that, you know, building towards that, mm. you know, uh, and, and trying to, you know, accomplish something school and never accomplish. And, uh, and just leading up to that game, I mean, it was a big challenge for us on the defensive side of the ball just because, I mean, you got a guy that's what he, – he's still, what, top ten – and uh, rushing yards ever by a, a player in uh, college football history, you know. So uh, 
just stepping up to the challenge and uh, trying to shut him down and things like that. It was it was big for us on defense and uh, it was big for us as a program. Just going to like I said, going to Memphis and mm-hmm. man, pretty much it was pretty much all maroon and white of that game. They always you know support and show love wherever the bowl game at. So uh, it was real big for us, big win. I mean, big for our coaching staff and things like that. Coach Kroon won what Coach of the Year that year, <laughs> I think uh, SEC. So I mean, it was uh, it was big for us, man. So. Obviously, I guess the kind of I guess the bittersweet part of that is that obviously y'all was going into a strong off season, like I was a, about to turn it around, and obviously we had the shooting incident that ended up happening. And um, so this is kind of like a two part question. Just talk to me, just from a being the leader of the defense standpoint, like how that impacted the team. A lot of people probably don't know it wasn't just, you know, I know Kirk was, you know, Quentin Wesley was part of that, but some of the other guys that were part of it and how that impacted the team. And then I guess, and then your initial reaction when you found out about it. And then I guess the second part of that is kind of like, you know, the fact that you were good friends with Quinn Wesley and like just being as a friend, how did you feel about that situation? So just first answer the part about how it impacted the team, then just, I guess, how it impacted your friend in that situation. I think it, impact, it, 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 it impacted the team a lot. I mean, like being at Mississippi, being at Mississippi State, we were, we was coming off of uh, that year. And, and honestly, man, I, th- I thought we was going to, you been, I thought we were going to compete for uh SC Championship that year. I mean, I did. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had all our top guys coming back. I mean, mm-hmm. we was, I mean, we was ready to go. Uh, we was all grown up, mature, and, and ready to lead. And uh, so I think, like, it might be a little different now, you know, with the rosters. But, I mean, to me, back then, like, Mississippi State, we was as good as the, the guys on the field. You know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't have, I don't think, like, death like that. Like, the death. Like, you can lose, you know, five – five starters and be like, okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm talking about all SEC guys. Right. Uh, and be okay. And, and I think that was the biggest impact on the team, like, losing, like, big-time players uh, who was counting on to be, like, uh, big-time players in the league. Some of the best – pretty much this. They some of the best players in the league, like Mike Brown. He was one, the, probably one of the best or the best, you know, tackle in the mm-hmm. conference, you know. So that was tough for us to kind of bounce back from that. And and I guess I'll just kind of um, back you up on that, saying, like, I mean, people don't understand. You lost Mike Brown, your star and left tackle. Like, these aren't, like, you said play, play positions. You know, I ain't saying other positions aren't important, like guard or some of these other positions, but you're talking about your star and left tackle, who, as you said, one of the best left tackles. I understand Quentin Wesley was supposed to be starting at D tackle, was kind of coming along, finally kind of coming into his own. Uh, and Johnson was part of that, I guess. Some were part of that. And then uh, Jamon Hughes, who everybody calls Zulu, because uh, from understand, they were telling me they were going to move you back out to the outside and he was going to man the middle at that time. So I don't know if that was going to be the case, but I heard that was even going to be the case. So he was going to be an important cog. So, um, I mean, either, yeah, either way you look at it, it was going to be, it was going to be, because I mean, hindsight moving forward, you know, I get hurt in the first game of the season. Even <laughs> if he he would have been the guy, you see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. looking at that, but to me, man, Ant Johnson was a beast. You see what I'm saying? And, he was a monster at, at DB. I mean, he should be playing. I mean, he should have played in the NFL. That's how good he was to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, I mean, no lie, going into because I think that was right before the spring game. Like, you ask anybody on that team, like, who was the best player on the field the whole entire spring? They said Quinn Wesley, including me. And I'm on defense. I'm coming off all SEC year. Mm-hmm. Quinn Wesley was the best player on the team the whole spring. Like, mm-hmm. he was coming to his own and. And it was tough for me because you know that was my guy. You see what I'm saying? Me and him was best friends. Go home and chill with him, things like that. And 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 it was tough. I and I know it was tough on him, just because you know he he saw the potential he had. And he was just coming to the home, and I, I just and situations like that. It was tough, man. I just I just wish it was a way that you know a a, a kid can learn from a mistake and then not impact them like super bad the way. I mean, it's just like there's no way to bounce back. You see what I'm saying? Like you you talking about you know guys from what. 18 to 21 year olds. I mean, it, it, you in college, you 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 having fun. You get these guys from these environments and uh, from these you know environments, these tough backgrounds where they come from, and you bring them into a college environment. And uh, mm. you know it'd be tough sometimes. So it takes some time for to, to mold them and get them right and and, and to get them you know to doing the right things. But I don't think you just you should just you know throw them to the wolves and uh, be like, all right, man, you're gone. And and that's so you write about that because obviously State had a situation a couple of years ago with uh, Jeffrey Simmons where people were trying to get rid of him and um, thought he was a bad guy because of I mean it looked bad and with a lot of stuff that was going on at the time about domestic violence that was a big deal but obviously we see how that turned out now that ESPN tried to make him look bad again but mm-hmm. you know obviously they 
got in a lot of trouble for that. But um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's, looking at like and just looking at Quinn Wesley, I mean, I mean, just how, look at how many kids lives he don't impact. You know, mm-hmm. like talking high school football. I mean, them guys, he ain't the head coach, but man, if you they sign, they have about a good five D one guys every year at high school. He had pretty much all them guys always talking about him and him being a dude that's don't help, you don't lead them down the right path and not going down the wrong path by his story. I mean, Mississippi State got one on this year, the running back, uh, Mark, from his school, so. hmm I was joking with him. I was like, you should, I was like, I told him, are you sure that uh, Chaney wasn't trying to get him, wasn't trying to uh, score some points and get him down there in Florida? <laughs> I, I, I want to come y'all, in. I know y'all, go ahead, Derek. I want to come in on what you said about throwing to the wood. Is that something you would like to see not only Mississippi State change, but just college football as a whole when a player makes a mistake, because you know, uh, during the recruiting process, they tout, they tout that they're gonna treat you like a father figure, right? Or yeah. family, right? So you yeah. just can't cut off family, you know? So is that something you would like to see change in college football? M- most importantly at Mississippi State, whenever a player makes a mistake, for them not to just throw a player to the wayside like that? Yeah, I think I think that's what every college man. Like I said, you get these you get these guys and me. I'm, when I when I talk about people, I'm talking about myself too. You know, I come from rough background and things like that. And you you get them in, and you put them in these situations, and it's just like some things you ain't never been taught. You ain't never have to deal with. You coming out your environment where you ain't never been around this type of people sometimes, or, or, or this it got destruction in your life and things like that. And first time some of these guys ever had a male figure. Uh, an older male figure in their life, you know, instructing them to do this and do that. And, and a lot of these coaches, they see it. I mean, they go to these dudes' houses and they see where they come from. I mean, so it ain't, like, sometimes it ain't a real surprise, but it just, like, I go back to, to the guy that got drafted by the uh, Bengals when he got in trouble. I mean, everybody, uh, what is it, the running back? The, uh, he played uh, Oklahoma. Hello, uh, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Nick. I will I don't his name. Mixing, yeah. I Joe mean, yeah, Mixon, what, yeah. Like, to me, like, what he did was wrong, but it's just like, like, you got a kid. I don't know. I think that happened his freshman year, but, I mean, he he drinking, she drinking, and it's like, you take this guy. I don't know where he's from, but I'm just guessing, like, you, from where I'm Somebody hit you, you hit them back. You see what I'm saying? No matter who it is, especially <laughs> both That's just how it is. You see, I mean, you ain't got a chance to learn. That's not, I mean, sometimes you're going to have to, you know, you know, turn the other cheek or just be like the, the big dude and just like, hold on, I can't do that, you know? But uh, sometimes, I mean, it's – you got to instill that. You got to kind of mold these guys, and that's what the coaches are there for, man. They coaches, they coaches that get uh, get behind these guys and make sure they, they're they teaching these guys, you know, not only football, but uh, life lessons and trying to make sure, you know, when situations like that happen, you know, hey, man, I'm not going to give up on you. You got to learn from that. That can't happen again, but we got to keep pushing, keep going. And that's what they did to Jeffrey Simmons. And, look, he's been a model citizen pretty much ever since, right? I mean, even before then, I mean, it was just, I mean, I'm from Knoxville, so I, I pretty pissed enough a lot of what ended up happening with it. But at the same time, it's kind of, you brand the person for the rest of their life because something they did when they're 18, 19, even sometimes 20, your brain ain't fully formed. I mean, a lot of us, we go back and see some of the stuff we might have did when we were that age. I mean, we probably, <laughs> I don't think we want nobody knowing that stuff. So, I mean, we, it just, I think he kind of came up in an age, obviously we have social media and people do that type of foolishness. Yeah. That happened, happened when we were at that age, nobody probably even knew about it, unless somebody snitched or something. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. I guess just get the stitches. Uh, which should have been your senior year, but that first game of the year, I think, what did you break your leg? Or was it a, a like a knee injury? I can, I can remember. No, it was an ankle. I had an ankle, okay. So what were you thinking when that first happened? Like, I mean, as an athlete, you know pretty much if an injury series most of the time. Um, sometimes you don't, most times you kind of know. So what was your first thoughts like when that injury happened? Like, I know it even was a possibility of you going pro after that that junior year. So um, what were you thinking as soon as that injury happened? Well, the first thing that came to my mind was, man, I can't believe we just lost a Louisiana Tech. But, uh, <laughs> 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 it, it was late in the game. It was, it was a lazy game when that happened. I mean, but <laughs> for to tell you the truth, I didn't even know it was broke, you know, because I was able to walk. Uh, mm-hmm. like they went to me, I was able to, you know, limp off the field and they put me in a walking boot. So mm-hmm. I was, uh, I thought I was cool, just a high ankle sprain, a real bad high ankle sprain or something like that. And I was sitting in the training room because I, yeah, I broke my ankle, but I broke my uh, my leg too. Like it was a clean break, you see what I'm saying? Like my, uh, my fibula. Mm-hmm. 
I was just sitting on the table in my training room, and I just started touching my leg and feeling it, and I can feel like the the bone moving my leg. I'm like, Hold on. Uh, uh, ain't supposed to do that. Hey, I'm, I'm going to get this checked out. And then once they uh checked it out, they saw, they not only saw that my, my, my leg was broke, which if that was if that was the only thing, I probably could have came back that season. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a clean break. They said they wouldn't take that on the hill, but then they they uh checked my ankle and I took my ligaments in my ankle, so that broke my shipment down the whole year. Did you get that doctor look when they looked at him and was like, oh? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I mean, not like I said with the with the uh with the broken leg, it was it was uh it was like okay, I mean it's it, it's bad. You have missed a couple of weeks, but you'll be able mm -hmm. to come back. Now when about my ankle, it's kind of like they they talked to me before and they were like, we got to put you to sleep just to check it out. Because if we try to test it right now, you know, while you're awake, it's going to hurt really bad, like some of the baddest pain you've ever been in. So if it if it's not good, we just going to no. go ahead and do surgery, you know, while you sleep. So when I when they put me to sleep, I didn't know if I, I was going to have the surgery or not. So when I woke up and saw it, Saw my thing, my leg in the air wrapped up. I had them broke down, man. So that was kind of tough right there. <laughs> so, I mean, we're not going to focus too much on that season because we know how that worked out. Um, but I know Derek kind of wanted to talk about uh, – go ahead, Derek. You want to, go ahead. Well, well um, we know you We know you had an awesome career at Mississippi State. You know, got drafted in the NFL. You achieved your dream. But, of course, coming out of high school, you were known as a pass rusher. Now you were you're the career leader in stacks at your high school. Yeah. Uh, do you wish they would have let you rush the pass a little more at Mississippi State? Yeah, especially when I uh, and they used to send me a little bit. I mean, but especially when I, uh, I first got there, you know, my uh, that was my thing coming out coming off the edge, and that's kind of why they put me at the wheel too, because you know you get to come off the edge, you know, a, a little more. But yeah, I wish I would. You know, I always I always uh, see myself as a. Uh, as a pass or sometimes I wish I would have I would have played the end and just hey, try put try to put on a way to play it be like one of these these short pass rushers out there. Uh Doomerville or uh you know, Mathis and all them guys. But yeah, that was my thing in high school, just going out the quarterback. I didn't play off the ball linebacker until I got to college. Yeah, that's Jeremiah. <laughs> I was setting you up for the next question. That's I guess that's what I was setting you up for. What's up? What was the question? I couldn't hear you. Uh, uh, I was setting up for a question about I guess going from I guess once Chrome left and then Mullen comes in. So kind of just talk about your first impression of Mullen and then just uh like what that transition was like going from Chrome to Mullen. I mean, especially it was coming from Florida too. Yeah, man. Like, like I said, everybody. I mean, Kroon was a good guy. He was a good coach. I mean, he, we, we. I mean, we all love him. I love him. I still talk to him to this day. I mean, he helped me out a lot. He taught me a lot of things. And uh, like I said, he taught me the most important thing: how to be a man, and how to uh, you know, get through, uh, get through life and tough times, things like that. One thing still, my first impression of Mullen, like man, as me being in Mississippi State. I mean, we only had one good one, one winning season, and it's a guy. This I'm talking about. This how I look at it. This guy coming from a school, he was an offensive coordinator of a team that don't want two nice championship. Uh so I'm like, hey, I'm all for you. If you finna try to come help us win, I'm all for you. I'm trying to win some football games. I mean, it's all the other stuff sound good, but hey, right now, my last year, I'm trying to win some games. So uh that was my first impression. And that's that's basically what he came in there and said, man. It, he know the blueprint to win. He 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 knew how to get it done. We follow, we follow his lead, he'll get it done. So I mean. With me being a captain that year, it just trying to help the guys, you know, come together and uh do what we had to do them uh they get in line behind him as he lead and we following uh you know the rest is history. What well, how was it like really like learning under Coach Bayless as well? I was here about and KJ came on about two months ago and talked about him. How was it? I mean, you're a strength and conditioning guy, you've always been very big on it. How's it like was it like learning from Coach Bayless, like doing that little short time period? Like I said, it was a, I mean, he one of the best coaches I ever had, Coach Bayless. I mean, uh, I value his opinion so much. Like when I was picking out an agent for the NFL, like he was in all the meetings when I was uh when I was interviewing the dudes, he was asking the questions, you know, things like that. So I value his opinion just because I mean he if we I mean, if we would have Bayless the whole time at Mississippi State, oh we would have been we would have been real. Cause he gets you prepared, man. I, we, one thing about him, 
and that's how that's what a strength coach is supposed to do. I mean, when you get through training with him, it, you you think you can do anything. You see what I'm saying? You feel like you yeah, nobody even though everybody working hard, everybody doing the same stuff pretty much at the top levels, you feel like, hey, they ain't better than me and they ain't putting more work than me. And, and and that's the kind of mindset that he have uh have his guys playing with and uh feeling confident, hey, you you don't wanna mess with me. So I don't know, so I'm just I guess struck when somebody just brought this up, but uh I was thinking about so being a football player. Most football players end up becoming Q dogs. What made you become a C? Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, ain't most football players. I see what you're saying, but Sims was a thing at Mississippi State. I don't know what it is now, but that was a thing at Mississippi State. Blue and white weekend was the uh the best. Right. And uh and things like that, man. And it's just like I knew more signals, you see what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. that that's which one fit me the best. Uh so it wasn't like, you know, me trying to, you know, be like this or be like that. It was just mm-hmm. like which one I wanted to play it. And uh, I just figured I just tried to pick which one I thought I thought thought would fit me the best, and Sigma was the best one for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I want to say this because I'm your frat brother. I just found that out myself. So, what was it like pledging and playing football at the same time? What I can't say going through intake because they die is my second home. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm Delta Phi, Mississippi Valley, yeah. right down the road. So what was it like going through intake? Man, it was tough. Practicing or preparing for football team? It was tough, man. It, the good thing, we, didn't, we did it in the spring, so it ain't like we did it like, you know, we didn't okay. know we could have did it like during the season, like we playing for games. So we just, you know, we, in spring, you just pretty much, you know, at grinding, seeing what the coach is trying to see where you at, see what they got to do throughout the summer and things like that, seeing how the school, how the squad going to look going to training camp, you know. But uh, it was tough, man, because it's, I'm happy they did it that way. Like they, I mean, the only thing that we really didn't, I mean, you know how it is, players. And I mean, the only thing we really didn't have yeah. to do just the stuff like you know during the day. But at night times, it was all. Uh, it was, <laughs> Don't I know, bro? Like I said, third eyes my second home. I, I got a chance to uh, be a part of a, a couple processes at third eye. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Know, uh, you appreciate it, though. I mean, what's your was, line name and number, man? Shout out to your frat. Say what now? What was your line name and number? Oh, I was 18. It was 19 of us now. I think we we wanted a lot of people. Oh, for real. Yeah. And our uh our uh line name was uh 19 uh 1914. Okay. Man, that is a lot, that is a large number, man. But we had 20. Oh, y'all had 20? spring <laughs> spring 2000, yeah. Oh, so they had them um AK AKAs at Mississippi State numbers. No, <laughs> <laughs> hey, go. shout out to the AKs. <laughs> we used to have like 30, 30 girl AKA lines. But uh, <laughs> my line there was blood. I, you, I thought you meant the whole line there. My line there was blood raw though. Blood raw, <laughs> like that. Blood raw, yeah. <laughs> do they choose? See, I don't know much about the Greek process. Do y'all? Do they choose your names, or do you kind of like get to like pick your name? No, they, 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 I, I don't know how I work either, but they let us choose our names there. Yeah. So I had two names. I chose one of mine, and I was given one. <laughs> I'm not well, gonna say what the one I was given. That's a secret. Kelly Price. <laughs> nah. Oh, okay. So, oh, hey. Oh, I can't say what I want to say. Gotta be good. Uh, we'll, 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 nah. Uh, Kelly Price. <laughs> bring up a catfish episode. All right. Let's. I guess let's get back to football. I just thought that was interesting or whatever because we got two normally uh fats on the uh show. Um, I think you know him. And then uh, Derek, he's of course a Q dog. Being Derek, he's a, a stigma. So I thought that would be interesting. Um, but let's uh, get back to football. So that year, y'all didn't make it to a ball game, but it seemed like definitely State was about to kind of, even though of course State, I mean, Croom kind of left Mullen with a lot of talent. So you know the, the ability of the players was there. But like, how did you like the energy on the team? Even though y'all didn't make it to a ball game, it did seem like the team was about to kind of be on an upward swing, and they hadn't missed the bowl since then. Yeah, I, I mean, you you kind of knew it, just like I said, like with how 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 practice was going and mm-hmm. how uh, how we trained in the off season. Like, I mean, they weren't gonna like we trained. Like, I think that was the first as a team. That's the first time we trained, trained. Like, we got after it, man. The uh, spring, like I mean, the uh, the fall, the uh, summer, like all the man. Like, Vegas played a huge part. Like, in the, yeah, to me, when you a head coach, you know, uh, the strength coach is probably one of your most important hires because he's going to be around the players the majority of the time. 
you know, so, I mean, we knew we were going to be good, and uh, we just didn't know when, you see what I'm saying? Like, we knew it was going to be good. We didn't know if it was going to be that year or the year after that or whatever the case may be, but we knew, like, the, the stuff that Mullen was putting in place, it was going to work out, you know, and then, mm-hmm. uh, and we competed in a lot of games. Like, well, man, we should have beat LSU that year. Well, and now, <laughs> oh, now, man, now, don't, don't give me and now, <laughs> and now, man, we would have been bold as we would have won out. <laughs> man. How long did it, did y'all speak to Tyson right after he didn't pitch the ball to Booby? Like, what was y'all thinking on the sideline when that happened? Like, when he didn't pitch the ball to Booby? I mean, I know y'all got a different vantage point, so you know maybe why he did what he did. But y'all like, man, what is he? What the hell? Man, he didn't pitch that ball. To I mean, you know, Tyson, my boy, so I ain't gonna. But it, it's like on, <laughs> no. on the on the sideline, you couldn't like on the side, just basically what you just said on the sideline, you couldn't really see. You know, you couldn't see like the pitch was wide open. See what I'm saying? You just. I mean, his mind, I mean, he probably thinking, you on the one yard line, there's no way I cannot get in here and we're on the one yard line. You see what I'm saying? Like, mm. uh, and he probably, man, he, 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 probably, he probably thinking, if I pitch it, he, is he going to catch it? If I pitch it, am I going to pitch it good? You know, I'm just saying, you never, you never know. You're on the one yard line, you probably thinking, man, I can squeeze in there. You see what now, I'm saying? what about once you got a chance to see it on tape, though? Once you looked at it on tape and you're like, oh. And I don't even know if I seen it on the, I don't know if I even watched it on tape, man. Some <laughs> but, but, it, <laughs> but did you look at the previous play? When Booby had to carry, Booby actually scored. Booby scored the the, uh, the previous play. Before <laughs> yeah. that, he scored. They just didn't yeah. call it a touchdown. Yeah, I think we did look at that. Because yeah. we scored that pretty, game pretty much over. I mean, they ain't got that much time to uh, – because I think they only took one knee, you know, once they, uh, once we didn't score. Yeah, and I, I think Ch- Chad Jones had an interception. In the, I think after that play, yeah. Chad Jones had like an interception or something like that. But I was just like, that man didn't pitch the ball. It was literally – Anyway, I don't even want to get stuck on that. I like yeah, we, we, man. We can we can talk about that all night because I I was so heartbroken about that play. Like, I'm like you know, let's pitch it. I uh, mean, with me, with me being down here and being down here in Baton Rouge, I'm like and working for a former LSU. Like, I had to hear so much noise about that. Like, oh, you got stopped at the one, just that close. Y'all know the little fishing. I got a meme sent to me. With Mississippi State, with the little fisherman state, you know, oh, you got, you got to be quicker than that. So, <laughs> you know, so I call holy hell about that. So, yeah, that's heartbreaking. <laughs> All right, so a, go ahead, Shane. I think a turning point in that season, too, uh, was when we decided, when, when Coach didn't decide to insert Banks into the starting lineup, too. Uh, once he, I think once he, once he got inserted into the starting lineup, our secondary actually improved tremendously. You know, he made a lot of mm-hmm. plays. And he showed up a lot of things back there for us, cause I mean, we was pretty good stopping the run, you know. And uh, but it will we'll get hit over the top a couple of times. And Banks, uh, he he yeah. pretty much eliminated that once we once we put him in uh in the starting lineup. I, and honestly, I was hearing about him even before I guess they put him on the field. I think I was sitting in the tailgate area, and I think Leon Berry came like, "Hey, we need to play Banks." So it was like all the defensive players going and pushing for him to get on the field. Like I mean, I'm obviously he probably was tearing it up in practice. So was y'all pushing for them to put him out there? Yeah, he was just a playmaker, man. He he knew how to. Uh, he had great ball skills, man. So it, if he if he around the play, he got good ball skills. He know how to judge the ball. So I mean, he gonna make the play. He, you just ain't gonna uh, you ain't gonna out jump him. I mean, he's smart too. So I mean, that he just he just had he just added something back that we didn't have, you know. And him mm-hmm. and Charles uh, complement each other well. Mm. So all right, so I mean, obviously that season y'all end up being five and seven, but even though everybody saw the turnaround coming, so. Then you kind of go through the draft process. Um, you know, you have a senior bowl, you do well. Um, I think you were like the defensive player, the South defensive player of the game or something like that. And then at the combine, you end up having the fast time for a linebacker. So how was you feeling when everybody – I mean, everybody watched the draft combine. How was you feeling like after you end up getting that fastest time at the combine? I felt pretty good. I mean, like I said, I felt pretty good in the team bowl. I felt I did a good job. I just don't – I feel good at the combine. My own, my medicals probably didn't check out as good. I mean, that's why, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I probably feel so low. But, I mean, I knew I was going to run a fast time. I mean, we was in the – right before we went out, all the linebackers, we was in the same room just talking. A lot of guys were telling me, oh, they're going to run this time, they're going to run this time. I ain't saying that because I already knew, like, hey, it ain't – it might be a couple of y'all in here faster than me, but ain't too many of y'all going to be running faster than me. But uh, it was pretty good because uh, I – that's one thing I think I always had, you know, with speed. I always, I always pride myself on being, you know, you know, fast. I'm a, I'm a fast linebacker. Not only just, not only athletic, but I, I, the intelligence of a great linebacker too. But speed was my thing, you know, running. So that was a, 
gave me a lot of confidence going out there. Uh, all the hard work you put in, I trained down there in Miami with Pete Bonarito. So I just uh, capped off a good, you know, uh, pre-combine training. Oh, I guess it, uh, you brought up the middle because I didn't know. I mean, I know you had that injury the year before. I didn't know that was considering you ran a four, five, four, I think, whatever it was. Um, obviously, your speed was still there. It didn't take away from that. So what was it about your medicals that was it something like teams worried about your long term potential being able to stay healthy? Yeah, when I it was my uh, it was my ankle. You know, I had a little degeneration. And then I had my right. I think the biggest thing was my because I got I ended up having surgery, you know, that. Uh, Another surgery in 08. Before okay. I did, but, but when I got hurt the uh, in the first game, mm -hmm. I had surgery uh, before spring practice started. Like right after that bowl game, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I had I had my knee scope, and then I think they found degeneration in my knee, so it was kind of like I had you know arthritis already in my uh, mm. okay. in my knee. Okay, that makes. Yeah, most people don't know about that. So like I didn't even practice that much. Like that spring that uh that all that happened. Mm. I, I practiced kind of sparingly that uh that spring. It is new. I mean, I didn't know because I I mean I was gonna get to your NFL career, but obviously it kind of that's kind of I guess one of the things I kind of get to, but I guess that adds a little bit to that. So I guess you end up getting drafted by the Eagles, going there, and then you kind of was like a special teams guy, and then those last two games, I think Stuart Bradley, I don't know if he got some type of injury, and you end up being inserted into the starting lineup the last two games, and you tore it up. So talk about just that experience. One, just getting a chance to start in the NFL for a team like the Eagles, and I guess, I think Vic was still there, obviously, and then, or just became the starter, getting a chance to start for the Eagles. And then a lot of people started talking about you like as that next, one of the next great players in the league. So talk about just the whirlwind of kind of like coming into the NFL, being able to start, and then immediately becoming one of the next guys. I mean, it was big. I mean, like like I said, I was, when I got drafted, I was upset because I thought I was at least, I thought the ladies I was going for a fourth round. You know, mm -hmm. you know then you got you to think about it, it's a blessing to be there. So, you know, uh, just getting the opportunity, I went there with a business mindset, like I always do. Like, like I said, football is something I've been playing forever, and it's just like, hey, I'm going I'm to go get it no matter what. And, uh, you know, being a seven-round pick, you got to go in there and you got to ball on special teams, you know. So that's that's kind of what I, what, I, what I try to pride myself on, you know, going there and dominating on, on special teams at the same time, learning the defense. So, I mean, early in, that, early in those camps and uh, things like that, they already knew that I could play. They knew I could play on the defense. They knew that I can handle, you know, uh, all the checks and things like that because I was doing all that in practice. So, I mean, before the season even started, you know, I was the backup Mike. You see what I'm saying? So, I, it was like we had other veterans there, but I was the guy behind uh, Stuart Barrett. They put me right there because they saw that through training camp and through the OTs and all that, that, okay, we put in this whole defense and things like that, and this guy, can he can handle it. He can handle getting the D-line lined up. He can handle making the checks and all these things. He can handle getting the calls from the sideline and uh, getting everybody to call. So I was, so I already knew. Like it was when he got hurt that I mean that I went in. But every week, you know, I had to prepare because I was the next guy up. I mean, so every week I had to prepare. Like, hey, I'm starting because you don't get that many reps in the NFL. You got to start. I probably get what three reps or something like that a day. Or so it went, it went that many. I mean, stars getting all the reps. And then, like I said, I'm real close. To, uh, coach uh, Mike Caldwell, now nah, he with the Tampa Bay Bucks. He the line, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's linebacker coach, but I used to be in here the whole time, making sure I knew everything. So if when that opportunity presented itself, I'm ready because it's like an internet. And if if I went out there and did good, all it would do is put somebody in there, or, or call somebody that's off the street and be like, "Hey, you ready to go?" And either I went, I don't think they probably were cutting, but I just went back to playing special teams again, you know. So. Uh, it was big, man. It was it was against the Dallas Cowboys too. He got hurt in that game. I went in and did good. And uh, the next game, uh, the next game, end up the the, uh, the miracle in the Meadowlands. End up having sixteen tackles in the fourth swarm to start the comeback. So I mean, it it was a, it was a real good rookie year. Uh, I think I had twelve tackles in the fourth swarm, being the, uh, the playoff loss against uh, Green Bay that year. The year uh, Aaron Rodgers won the Super Bowl. So it was a good rookie year, man. Well, like, I guess that year, I think it was the same year. I mean, all of us kind of grew up and watched Michael Vick. But when he, of course, when he was at Vitek and then when he first got in the league with the Falcons and all of that, we've seen that just as fans. But I was just seeing that up close. Even that year, that was kind of like his resurgence. Like, people didn't even necessarily expect it. But, you know, I think I think Kevin Cobb got hurt. He came in and Coach Reed was kind of like, I think he made the statement. Like, it was like an old superstar regained his ability or something like that. And then he ended up starting Vick, like, after saying he was going to start Cobb. So talk about seeing Vick kind of like 
become that guy again. Like you get to see it now as fans, we watching on TV, but you seeing it every day at practice. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, it was. I mean, Vic was pretty much in the same situation I was in at that time because he was the backup guy, and Kevin Carr was he was a real good quarterback. I mean, we. I mean, but like I said, you got to be ready when your opportunity presents itself, and that's what's one thing Vic did. I mean, he was professional about it, being this guy that's don't bend the guy. You know, had to humble himself. You know, to come back and he, in his role, and he prepared the way he's supposed to prepare it. And when he he got a chance to go in there, he executed, and he was what I think second in MVP. Uh. I like run up an MVP that year. I mean, he – and pretty much everybody – we had a young team that year. So, pretty much everybody looking at – everybody, like, that had to be on the team that year being like – they grew up watching Vic, was a fan of Vic. So, it's like – I wouldn't say you in awe, but it's like, man, I'm on the same team. Mike Vic, he doing the same things he did, you know, when he was playing back when I was watching him in uh, high school when he was with the Falcons, you know. So, it was, it was big, man. All right, so I guess obviously that year, like you go into the offseason, I think it was a guy, Brian Baldinger, and he was already saying, I saw, I guess, even on the Wikipedia page, and they kind of talked about it at the time, he said you were already one of the best linebackers in the league. Did you hear about that comment at the time, that he was saying that you were one of the best? I mean, stuff to get back around to you. That he was calling you one of the best middle or linebackers in the league at that time? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I heard about it. I mean, I, I saw it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they do, that, they do that kind of stuff all the time, and it, in, uh, in the NFL, you know, projecting. I mean, we do it. You do it in college, too. I mean, so uh, trying to project players and things like that. I mean, at that time, I did. I had a lot of confidence, and I felt that I was going to, uh, you know, eventually evolve into mm -hmm. one of the best linebackers in the NFL. But one thing about being the best, you just got to you got to do it over a long period of time. It ain't just a game here and game there. You got to do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we're moving kind of 2011, and then you get a chance to start that whole year. How was it, man, just get a chance to start a full year in the NFL? Just uh, like you say, you started in that previous your rookie year strong, and you come into that second year, and I think they didn't even have you in the middle at first. Uh, oddly enough, I found like a column where they were saying they should move you to the middle. So how was that kind of coming in? And then you know they moved you to the middle, and then they have a chance to start the whole season. I mean that year was that year was. I mean I had a good year, but that year was tough just because you know we we end up uh, we end up fighting our DC, which we had a lot of man. We I think we had a. We had a record amount of, uh, of rookies that played that year that actually got started games that year. I'm talking about my rookie year. And then we fired our defensive coordinator, uh, who I thought was really good. He helped me out a lot. And it's, and then it was a lockout year the next year. So it's like we got a new defensive coordinator and we got a lockout. So it it, it kind of – no – we didn't have no kind of offseason and things like that. And – then they put me in another, a different position, you know, starting off the season. So it's a new defense. And I'm playing a new uh, – I'm playing the Sam linebacker, you know, which I'm in front of tight end. Like, you know, my game on speed. So, I mean, you're, you're in front of tight end. You, you got to – you're taking on more blocks. You see what I'm saying? Like, you're in front of tight end to the strong side a lot. And then get moved back to the mic. So I really – I mean, it's a new defense. So I had to learn, you know, the mic position as well. Well, once I moved back. But, like I said, I'm grateful for that. I mean, I – uh the thing is, we was, a, we was a very talented team that year. That was the year that, uh, you know, that, that, that what his name is? Uh, Vince Young came out with the, you know, the dream team little thing uh, before the season. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, because we had a lot of talent. Like, we, we were stacked now, and uh, we didn't live up to that. You know, we, I think we finished season eight and eight. We only missed the playoffs by one game, but, I mean, we finished season eight and eight. Mm -hmm. But, like I said, it was a blessing to, you know, the starting in NFL. I led the team in tackles. Uh, Second on the team in picks was tied for first in the NFL for linebacker interceptions that year. So I mean, it was like I said, it was a, a good. It was a good year up to my last game when I got hurt. You know, uh, last game of the season I got hurt that year. Mm. Uh, hurt my neck and ended up having to have uh, a neck neck surgery with my fused neck. So oh, okay, yeah. I guess I guess I, you kind of answering the question before we even get there. I guess I was going to ask um what type of conversation they had with you um. When they traded for D'Amico Ryan's, because uh, obviously he played same. Because even when they traded for him, I was like, I don't, I don't know, though Ch Chaney played middle, but I ain't know about the neck injury in the pre. So, mm -hmm. did you kind of knew? It, did you kind of know what it was when they traded for uh, D'Amico that he was gonna be the guy in the middle? And then I know Derek has a question for you after that. Yeah, I mean, you knew he was gonna be the guy. I mean, like, but like I said, I played all all the positions. So it, I wasn't just a Mike linebacker, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. D'Amico was Mike linebacker. I was a Mike. I was a Mike and a real linebacker, so I could play either role. You know, mm -hmm. so it didn't matter. It's just whichever one they wanted to put me at. And uh, 
I welcomed it. I welcomed it too, just because I mean I have it. That was gonna be my going on my third year in the league. I didn't. I haven't played it beside nobody like D'Amico either. So I would. I was mm-hmm. all for it just because you get to learn from somebody on being in the Pro Bowl and things like that. The position. But I mean, they had to. I mean, I had to. I mean, they signed uh, D'Amico before they even knew that I can play again. You see what I'm saying? Like you have a neck surgery. I mean, he ain't, he ain't guaranteed I'm gonna be able to play when it's time to uh, mm-hmm. go because that because that happened in the last game of the season. So. I had a surgery in January. You can't find out till I really can play the training camp. You see what I'm saying? You can do all the off-season stuff, you know, rehab and all you want to, but until you start hitting, that's when you guys are going to find out. And you can't wait all the way to uh, August to decide uh, if this guy can play or not. So, Right. Uh, well, from a fan's point of view, like I was the same way like Jeremiah was when they brought in the maker. Because as a fan, we don't know the inner workings. All yeah. we know is our bulldog, you know, has a starting Pro Bowler coming in. Yeah. But the question I want to ask you, what was it like getting a chance? Miss, or Eagles went back to the world and drafted Fletcher Cox. What was it like two Bulldogs on that defense? I mean, it was fun. Like I said, I had a good relationship with uh, with Coach Reed, and he actually talked to me a lot about uh, Fletcher Cox. I never I never forget. I mean, I, I me and him was talking one time. We ran into each other. Uh, Cause you know during that time it was off season and stay, uh, we ran into each other like right outside the weight room man. and he asked me again like what you think about Fitz Carter? I told him I said man hey uh, you gonna if you don't draft him man you are gonna regret it now so if mm-hmm. he fall if he fall down into you make sure you take him and I I ain't that I didn't say he listened to me or nothing like that right there but I'm just saying but I did tell him that like hey this guy is the truth I mean we knew from the first get go my uh my senior year this dude is gonna be the truth. Uh, uh-huh. Now, Coach Reed has had a knack for drafting Mississippi State players. Does he still call you and ask oh, you about four Mississippi State players? Because I'm yeah. a Chief fan, and we're loaded with four Mississippi State Bulldogs. Yeah, but he don't, he don't have to call me because he, he already know me. I'm going to hit him up about him. You know, uh, <laughs> I, he hit me up. But we, like, like I said, he wanted, he wanted the most genuine coaches in the NFL. Everybody, I mean, even if he don't cut a player or, you know, had to release a player or, or get it, like, it ain't too many guys you're gonna know that don't like uh mm-hmm. Coach Reed. And me and him got a good relationship. We talk uh all the time. I mean, I kind of I kind of bite myself a little bit because right before what it is, I got the job in Florida last year, probably around at the beginning of March. But and I had already been talking to Coach Reed too. And probably like a week later, he called me off me a job. Uh, what the team. play or the coach? No, nah, not to play. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> hey, man, I think you still got some years left, man. You can we have an We need some. We, well, we drafted Willie Gay, but what, it would be nice to have two Bulldogs. What, hey. a couple Bulldogs. You, Chris Jones, Willie Gay, Maroon, I, Bulldogs I love, on that D. I love <laughs> to play, man, but I ain't trying to hit nobody right now. I, ain't, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, you realize the old, I think you realize the old now. <laughs> but, hey, yeah, I mean, I would love to see you, of course, on the Chiefs staff. I mean, like, that would just give me another reason to root for you, you know, even though you're over there with them chompers. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, like I said, me and Coach Reed, we got a uh, real good relationship. They got, like, a, uh, and like you said, they got a lot of Bulldogs. I mean, I mean, I gave him, I, I know Willie Gay a little bit, so I talked to him a little bit, and I talked to Coach Reed about him a, a little bit also, so, uh, they do right. He know one once he and, and they ball for him too now when they get there. Mm-hmm. You know, like, hey, he do a good job with him. So, so you were one of the you were you were one of the people that he called a vet really gay when he said he vetted it. <laughs> oh yeah, like I said, I, I, I he don't have to call me because I'm always like if, if it's a guy that I know this uh that's coming out, I'm gonna let him know about it. You see what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. especially like Mississippi State guys and things mm-hmm. like that, guys from my area from my hometown, like before I even got to Florida, I always, you know, talk to him about guys like that. So all right, so um, I guess that particular you and I'm not starting. Was it? I guess not. That you brought up the injury. Do you uh, do you think it was because like that lingering injury you just couldn't kind of get back in sync after? I mean, I never knew you had a neck injury. Was it because you couldn't get back in sync coming into that season? Nine that that can get back in sync. It just I mean, and then that year they also they brought in Demico Ryan. They also uh, drafted a linebacker in the second round. Now, if you the Eagles don't draft a linebacker that high, never. See what I'm saying? So they have to, they drafted Michael Kendrick that year. Uh, in the second round, so you know you draft a linebacker that high. I mean, this guy supposed to come in and uh, play, but I never like my mindset. Like when I was there, 
is man, what God has for me, it is for me. You see what I'm saying? So like when we was going through OTAs and things like that, I like they was kind of like D'Amico was the mic, and then me and Mike was the uh, Michael Kendrick was the uh the wood linebacker. So I was just and then we was like rotating with the ones, and I just basically told him, like, hey, y'all can put him with the uh, put him with the ones. I'd be the backup for now, but I know when it's when it's time to train the camp, I'm gonna I win my spot back. You know what I'm saying? So just go ahead and do it. And, and, and no lie, when we started training camp that year, yeah, I was balling. I I got I I was I was going with the twos, and I put, I was with the ones pretty much after the first couple of days. You know, because if you know Coach Reed, I don't know if they can still do it or not. But we used to go hard in training camp. He take care of you during the season, but in training camp he gonna find out like and who can go. And uh, we, the bad thing about it, as soon as I, uh, as soon as I got the, as soon as they told me uh, I was with the ones again, like, hey, you with the ones, you can go out there. The first practice I pulled my hand training. First mm. practice. And, and it was just no look. I mean, I was, and I was out the, the whole training camp. So it was like, I, I was trying to come back, trying to come, come back. So I was, I pretty much out the whole training camp. So then, you know, going to the season, you know, Michael Kendricks and uh, D'Amico end up, being the stars, I ended up starting uh, five games that year, but still, I mean, that kind of threw me off a little bit. That uh, that hamstring injury. All right, so what did you? I guess it kind of going a little bit back to Fletcher. Like, I mean, Fletcher. I mean, I felt like he was a good player at Mississippi State, and he had a nice little, a solid senior, especially toward the end. He got very hot toward the end. Were you surprised that he just kind of hit it the way he did, just starting off like um that first year? Like, I mean, now he's one of the best D tackles in the league. That he kind of started off so strong. Um, even though he probably was supposed to still be a senior in college. You saying his rookie year? Yeah, like he came in so strong. Like, I guess uh, Fletcher, like, he, I mean, he's, you know, coming out today, you're nice, like one of the best D tackles in the league. Like, that, even though, I mean, his Mississippi State career, he wouldn't, then probably ball out every year, but he still was pretty good. But he come in that first year and just hit it and just now he's one of the best D tackles in the league. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you always saw it just because Fletcher, I mean, Fletcher was so big. I mean, and people forget, like, Fletcher wasn't, Fletcher, he wasn't that, like, weight-wise, he wasn't that big, you know, when he first got there. And just going through that training, being a dude that was super athletic like that, like, man, Fletcher probably was running with a four six four five, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in high school. And then you put that weight on him, and he ain't really slow down, you see what I'm saying? So he, he's steady getting bigger and stronger, and he still got that, that defensive end uh athletic ability at that position, you knew mm -hmm. he was gonna be uh you knew he was gonna be like that. And I mean sometimes stats can lie to you. I mean St Fletcher was dominant in college. And one thing good about uh Fletch, you know, he was he was a leader too. You see what I'm saying? Like he ain't like he bringing people with him. Like he gonna help other guys out as far as like trying to get the team better and be a leader and doing the right thing, trying to be an example. And I think that helped him a lot too. Okay. Um, so I guess after that season, I guess going into, I don't know if it was in training camp or not, you end up getting, I think it was, I guess maybe in training camp, you end up getting cut. So how, how was that? I mean, you're going from, you know, you probably wanted to starter, all that stuff, and then you end up getting cut. And I guess it is the nature of the NFL. But how was that trying to, at that point, trying to hang on? Because I think at that point you had played three years. I think somebody told me that if you've been on an active roster, you can't be like on practice squad or anything like that. It's either you in or you out. So how was that? trying to hang on to the league at that point, knowing that you kind of was in a, you either on the roster, or you're not on the roster situation. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was tough, but like, uh, I don't know what the rule is. Now, I know they changed rules a little bit to try to help guys to, to get back on the practice squad, to be eligible for the practice squad, but I don't know how they are now, but that's how, how you said, that's how it was uh, mm. when I played. Uh, once you, you acted for a certain amount of games, you can't go back on the practice squad, but, mm. uh, it was tough, but like you said, I had that neck injury, like in 2011. I had that neck injury in the end of 2011. In 2012, mm -hmm. it didn't. Uh, and Chip Kelly was there too that, that year. I got cut. He was a head coach. Uh, so that 2012 season, it ain't bother me at all. But going into that in that 2013 season, uh, it started bothering like the first preseason game. You know, I went down and made a tackle on special teams play against the Patriots. And I got a sting, a real bad sting, and I ended up having to come out and I didn't go back in the game. And uh, I had a good game on special team. He said, and especially in Coach Toby, man, you had an awesome game. But after that, after that hit, it seemed like every time I hit somebody, like I felt it in my left side. Like you don't post, you don't get a sting every time. You get a sting once in a while, you know. But I was getting it every time, like in my left side, and it kept bothering me, bothering, bothering me. So that affected me a lot, you know. 
trying to prove yourself to a new coaching staff that just got there. You see what I'm saying? With Philadelphia Eagles. So that kind of uh, hurt. Then I got picked up by the Falcons, played a couple games with them. Luckily, I played over what? I think I played over four or five weeks. I think if you get four four active roster games in, that's that's a credit season. So that got me my fourth year. And then you like went to the Broncos training camp. Same thing ended up happening to me uh, when I was with the Eagles. Uh, playing pretty good in the preseason. Told my hand, uh, pulled my hand straight again against the Broncos in the game, and couldn't play no more. So I mean, you you trying to like I said, anytime you trying to prove yourself and you get hurt, it's kind of hard for them to keep you on the uh, on the team. Like with Chip Kelly, I mean, they knew I'm trying to prove myself. End up getting hurt, and I had to uh, and things like that. And then with the Broncos and training camp, get hurt. And can't play no more to, uh, that preseason. But ended up getting picked up by the Raiders, played, I think, nine weeks with them and got another credit season. That was my last uh, year. What kept you What kept you kind of, like, pushing on then? Because obviously at that point, you start playing around with neck injuries. That's, like, some scary stuff. So was it just wanting to be in the league, just trying to, you know, I guess it's a dream, of course, to everybody. But, like, you can, of course, a knee injury or hamstring, that's one thing. You start talking about neck and stuff like that. What kind of kept you kind of pushing on, even though, you know, necks are, like, a little – like, a, I guess that's a shaky thing. Dude. Just wanted to keep playing. I mean, you know, I mean, really just probably just being dumb, too. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, You said Nick. I was like, man, I don't know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but, yeah, hey, thank God nothing serious ain't happened. But, I mean, like, my my, uh, yeah, my my wife had a good talk with me, man. We just, I, after, the, after the Raiders uh, let me go, we just decided, I mean, it was, it was going to be it. Don't try to, you know, push it and, and, mm-hmm. and keep pushing, keep pushing it. Cause luckily, like with those teams, like with the with the with the with the Falcons, I really, I was on the team, but you know, I ain't really played. You see what I'm saying? And then when I got with the with the uh, the Raiders, I didn't play on the defense. I just played a special team, so my action was kind of limited. You know, I guess that was a blessing in disguise. You know, not for me not to get out there and actually be banging like I was when I was with the uh, with the Eagles. And so, um, I guess we're gonna kind of move along and guess. I mean, I didn't know injuries impacted you to that level, and that's something you really you don't make excuses. So I guess you didn't bring up that you had all those injuries in your career. But like moving along, you end up I guess going back home, and then uh, being I don't did you volu- you volunteered at first right with the team, and then eventually became a defense coordinator before becoming the coach uh, with your old alma mater school. So talk about that process of uh, I think you told me once that you wanted to go back and coach high school ball. So talk about that process of I guess going back and coaching high school ball. Yeah, I always knew I wanted to. I wanted to coach. Uh, when I was playing football, I know I wanted to. Once I was done, no matter whether I was college, high school, whatever, I wanted to go back and coach. I mean, and I always wanted to start in high school, just go back. You know where I was from and help the kids uh, in my community, in my area. Uh, and I just, I just, I just thought that coaching, you know, trying to find your passion and like what you want to do, you know, outside of like, because you can't play football forever. So I mean, even though that's, you know, that's something you can't do it forever. But I just wanted to find something that I was passionate about. And something that are gonna help people. You see what I'm saying? Try to put two in the together. Coach, I mean, you passion, I'm passionate about football, and I'm passionate, and I want to help people, uh, especially like you. So that's why. That's how I got. That's how. That's how I want. That's that's why I wanted to coach. Just to, uh, cause I love football. And I want to help people. And I want to help our youth, especially our young men. Uh, you know, help them mold and, and guide them and uh, get them right in society. And like I said, it was it was a the, the coach actually the head coach when I first got to my school. When I came back, was the was my defensive coordinator when I played. So it was an easy transition for me, you know, learning from him and things like that. And uh, he resigned, you know, because he was he's been he's been coaching a long time, yeah, longer than I've been living right still to this day. And uh, you know, they picked me for the job. How was that? I think uh, I'm trying to remember the newspaper article. They said the team had made the playoffs, maybe even since you had played or somewhere close to it. Like, how was it? That first year, I don't know. If, I don't think I made the playoffs, but that second year you did. How was that coming in, and what stuff did you do to turn around that program? Not necessarily how I felt to turn around the program, but what stuff did you do to get the program turned around? Because obviously it was good at some point, but there were some things that kind of got lost, I guess, in the shuffle, so to speak. So, what did you do to uh, turn around the program? Oh, uh, I mean the 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 last the last time the team had been to the uh, the playoffs was 2011. The last time they won over five games was when I played, so 2004. So the things I did, I just try to do the things that I learned in college, I mean, and, and learned in the NFL and just implementing like a strength program, you know, 
like I said, strength coaches, and I hired a lot of coaches, you know, hey, in a public school, you can't, you only can pay a certain amount of coaches, but man, I made it work, you know, to try to, you know, uh, and me coming from the NFL, I mean, uh, the money that I used to get paid, I didn't need it, so I used to give it to my, uh, you know, try to break it off to them, just so I can have more coaches, more eyes out there on the guys, and just implementing that, you know, getting on, taking my guys on trips, on college tours, doing this, doing that, you know, putting their names out there for colleges to see them. And then when you, in, in, in the flow of doing all that, grinding real hard, posting our workouts for, you know, other kids in the area can see it. And, and and doing all that, other kids from other schools see it. And then our kids start talking about it. Everybody seeing what we doing. Guess what? Now these kids want to come to our school because we doing some other schools ain't doing. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, that's kind of how we, I, I got it turned around there. And I mean, it's, it was, it was the best we had, what, I think about at least 10 guys signed uh, scholarships as far as, you know, D1, D2 uh, scholarships and things like that. So it was good. I had a great time. Ain't gonna lie. I mean, all these women made the playoffs out of my first year because the guys, they didn't really know, you know, how to win. We competed. We lost, I think we lost three games in the fourth quarter that year. I'm talking about the end, late in the fourth quarter. So we didn't really know how to win. You see what I'm saying? It's kind of almost just like, Mullen first year, then that second year, boom. You like mm-hmm. one of the best teams around there. You know, so uh, that's how kind of how it went. So do you think you kind of had that cachet of being like you Chaney, you, I mean, played in the NFL, you did. I mean, I'm saying and those kids, you like a local hero. We had Omar on uh, last week, and he, he's, of course, that local hero in Knoxville. So did that, you think, kind of help you get those kids to buy in that you was like one of the, I guess some people see that one of the OGs that kind of made it to the NFL? Yeah, that helps out a lot. I mean, they see somebody that played at that school, somebody that went on to play a college football in the best conference and then go off and not only play in the NFL, but start in the NFL and do a pretty good job. And uh, But like I said, they see a guy that also came back, you know, and hired guys that they knew, they're going to know, they're going to look out for them, they're going to love them uh, and coach them hard. And they saw the, uh, like I said, they saw you just case. A kid ain't going to, a kid ain't – you can't get everything out of a kid until they know how much you love them. That's what that, – that's kind of how I try to – uh that's kind of how I try to coach. You know, I'm, I'm on here to serve, you know, and I try to pour everything into them. That's why I'm taking them on these college trips. Hey, I'm uh hitting up all these college coaches for you. I'm here every day grinding for you. You ain't the only one working hard. I'm working hard for you, man. And, uh, if I'm going to actually go out there and play and, and give it your all on, on Friday nights, I'm going to give you my all in the, uh, them other six days a week. So, I guess – after those two years, you end up deciding to go to Florida. I mean, had you decided at that point that you wanted to coach college ball anyway, or was it just, you know, Mullen? Um, I think that was at this first year of Florida, you know, actually joining the staff. So what was it? I mean, was it just you was ready for that move? Yeah, I was ready for that move. It, it was kind of like, I mean, I wanted to, you know, get, see what the next level was about. And, like, those guys, I mean, I wouldn't say it made it easier, but it was just different just because – uh them guys that were seniors my last year, that was the class that I kind of came in with. So I had them be with them freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior year. So, and then I just wanted to make that jump. And like I said, I always try to do a good job uh, keeping in contact with coaches to coach me. And I always kept in contact with uh, Coach Mullen and things like that. And I just told him I wanted to, I wanted to try it out. I'm ready to try uh, try to get on the next level. And I, I went down to see him. Uh, to see him the week they played Florida State in his first year. See the, the week they played Florida State, talked to him a little bit, and by the time February came around, he had never told me he had a spot for me. So how, how's it – I mean, the thing, honestly, that people even heard about – you say about Mullen throughout the year, that it's sometimes some coaches didn't always want to work for him and stuff like that. So as somebody that was a player, played for him, what made you want to go, I guess, work for Mullen? Because, I mean, sometimes he kind of get a bad rep for that. So what made you kind of want to go trust and work under him and learn from him? I mean, he's very he's a very accomplished coach. I mean, I mean, I my experience with Mullen has been uh, good. I mean, I, I was with him when he was the first he came up, his first time ever being a head coach. You know, I was a player for him, and and now I mean, I can't talk about you know how other people should because they they experiences with him are, are different than what mine was probably. I, I mean, I don't know, but how he is. How he is now to actually coach for him, I mean, he, he's really good. I mean, coaching uh, with him, he's real good. I mean, we get a lot of time. I mean, we get a lot of time off. I mean, I'm pretty sure we probably compete with a lot of people on time off for a staff. You know what I'm saying? He, he, as long as you get your job done, he, I mean, he, he's very open minded. I mean, he listens to you, office doors stay open. I mean, so, I mean, he, 
I don't know how he was when he first became a head coach because I was on the player side. But as of right now, I mean, people probably dying to come coach coach with him now just because I mean we get like I said in college ball you get a lot of time off. I mean that don't go hand in hand, but we get a lot of time off. He he let his coaches coach. Uh, he let the, the recruiting staff or because I'm a part of the recruiting staff do do our thing, man. And he just. He's doing a great job building this uh, program. Ten wins first season, eleven wins last year, and I mean, hopefully we have a season this year. Because I mean, I think we'll do a real good job. <laughs> so I guess I kind of wanted to end a little bit, or well, maybe two questions. First question is kind of a lot of the Bulldog fans, even some of your former teammates, were kind of pushing for you to return to the staff uh, when uh, Leach first joined up. Like, talk about that possibility of just maybe rejoining Mississippi State at some point. Um, is that something that's a possibility out there, like you get in an on-field position with Mississippi State at some point? I mean, you never know. I mean, like I said, I talk I, I mean, I talk to the coaches there now. I mean, I talked to uh, Moorhead when he was there. I mean, so I still know guys there, you know, Jay Perry, I mean, Cohen. I mean, I know a lot of the people there that was there when I was there, you know, so uh, – mm -hmm. It would be a great opportunity to come back there. I mean, I would love to come back to Mississippi State. I mean, it's where I went to college yet. Where I, I, I balled on the field yet. And, uh, I know what it's like to, uh, to put on a maroon jersey and go out there and uh, give it all the ground for your state, you know. So, I, I um, say what? Speaking of you, Speaking of you saying that, we know you're there at Florida now for a paycheck. You know, that's your job. Does it feel weird putting on that ugly blue and orange? <laughs> How does you went to Mississippi State, man? You're yeah. a bulldog. You maroon. I mean, you you play to beat Florida. Does it feel weird? A little? Yeah, I don't think it feel weird. I mean, just because. I mean, we was on the SEC. We on the West. Mississippi State on the mm -hmm. West. Florida on the East. They don't even play each other every year. I mean, what? How many? I don't know. What's the the span and years that they go without playing each other? But. You know, you know, it don't feel, I don't, it don't feel weird, man. It's just, hey, I'm, I'm from Florida. I mean, even though, uh -huh. even though, like when I was growing up, it was Florida was third. You know, when I was watching, I mean, it was Miami, Florida State. Then I probably you know check uh -huh. out. Well, uh, since that, could you work for Ole Miss? You said, <laughs> I don't know. Or not. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right, so. That, that, Strong, strong, strong conviction. I don't, I don't know if that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I kind of wanted to close. And I was kind of thinking of something maybe a good to lead the fans with, but I was kind of thinking of somebody kind of went through, I mean, a lot as far as to one, get to college, and then once you got in college and there's different incidents and then getting injured, then the NFL, you went through the wars, and now you kind of establish a good post career life and married kids, and, you know, possibly going to have a long college coaching or potentially maybe pro career. So talk to anybody that's really a young athlete. I mean, you've been a coach, so you had to talk to those guys about, you know, what you would tell them if they decide they want to do this. Because obviously, you had to go through a lot just to be able to be successful with it. So, what would you say to those guys who are thinking about embarking on that college and then maybe NFL career? You talking about playing wise? Or yeah. Coaching? Well, I guess both. Like, I mean, really, anybody that's decided just to get into this. Like, I mean, because obviously, you don't want through the challenges all the way. Like, as far as you know, getting into college, the whole situation, and then got in college, you got hurt. The NFL, obviously, you was looking like the next guy, and then, you know, injuries kind of, you know, pulled you down a little bit. So, talk to, you know, that young guy who's thinking about, oh, man, I want to be a football player, but they don't understand everything that it takes really to really stay in it and then be one of the best at it. Well, one thing about me, one thing different, like, I was real athletic, man, but anybody ever tell you, like, anybody that's ever coached me from high school all the way to the NFL, every coach I've played, man, they're going to tell you that a change is going to work. And that's the number one thing, man. You gotta be willing to put the work in. Like, I kind of, I kind of said, man, I ain't, I ain't have a plan B. Man, I was putting all my eggs in one basket, and I was gonna make it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you gotta make sure, like, whatever your dreams and goals is, you putting that, you putting the work in, uh, and you grinding, and you, you kind of, you don't let nobody outwork you. I mean, be smart, but you don't let nobody uh, outwork you. Like my first, my first off season at Mississippi, like you remember, I told you, I got the uh, Mississippi State a day before training camp kept started. So I had off season. But the second year, you know, going to my sophomore year, I won a award for the, the hardest work on the team. Did that the same year, the, the year after that. And then when Mullen got that, the same thing, like, it, it ain't like it was no day. It was like a constant grind. Like, I always had the mindset, hey, if I don't make it, it's going to be because I wasn't good enough or I got hurt. 
it won't be keeping good. It gonna be, it gonna it's not gonna be because I ain't real hard. And I kind of mm-hmm. so I mean that's that's the that's the mindset you gotta you gotta have. It's kind of like you know what Kobe known for the mama mentality, man. You got to go yeah. out there. I'm just saying you got to go out there. You got to sacrifice what other guys ain't gonna sacrifice. You know, watching film, studying, getting in there uh, with the coaches, trying to learn learn your game, perfect your craft. And that's just something I try to preach to my guys. And on the coaching end, uh, and if you go to the coaching side of it, man, I always do try to tell my high school guys. I try to tell these guys here in Florida too. Uh, you never know who, like, what them guys gonna do, where them guys gonna be at. You see, what I'm saying like, when I when I was playing, like, I respect every coach. You see, what I'm saying no matter who you, you a GA, whatever the case may be, man, you could some hey, in some way you could help me get better. If, if I don't think you know what you're doing, I'm still going to respect you, man, and, and feel and make you feel like you're the greatest coach. Because you never know. Like, I mean, Joe Judge was a GA at Mississippi State when I played. <laughs> I'm just saying, you never know, like, who, like, uh, Marcus Marcus Love or uh, Levins was a GA at Mississippi State. Uh, Freddie Kitch was a running back coach at Mississippi State. Uh, who else? I mean, it's just like you got uh, Jody Wright. He with the Giants. He was just, you know, you got so many guys. There was there probably in roles that you probably you probably think man whatever whatever this whatever that and uh but they see they 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 respect you because they see how hard you work they see you respect them in their position and you y'all in this thing together trying to improve and trying to get better so I mean you got you got like I said don't matter who it is a John or whatever you treat everybody with respect because you never know man them, you you know how it is these days man it's all about who you know and your connections you know uh, to, to to get your foot in the door sometimes so. You just got to grind, man, and people use that word a lot, but, I mean, you got to really put in the work, like, really. I used to, like I told you, I used to tell my high school guys, man, ask, ask any coach, Mullen, Croon, Bayless, uh, Coach Nile, Pollard, those scrim coaches, ask any of them, Reed. When it comes to when they come to working, oh, I'm going to put the work in now. If I don't make it, like I told you, it's going to be because I just wasn't good enough or I got hurt. It ain't going to be because – and put the uh, work in. It ain't gonna be no water cutter shoes over here. Yeah. So, AJ, you want to go ahead? Uh, so, first thing I want to thank you uh, just for uh, joining us tonight, man. Um, like we are friends. I call him Chaney because uh, nobody call. Like, we don't call him Jamar. Jamar Chaney. We call him Chaney. So, yeah, yeah, everybody, y'all got thrown off by that. That's uh, that's what everybody calls. Nobody calls him Jamar. We call him Chaney. <laughs> uh, but thanks for joining us tonight, man. Um, because I think I definitely. Like I, said, I had a lot of things on there, but I was like, man, Chaney had a long career, and then I didn't know about the injuries and things like that. Because even I was like, it seemed like I guess you were kind of moving. I was like, it was kind of weird how you went from starting to like not playing as much. I was like, how did that happen? Then uh, you find yeah. out because most times people don't always talk about the injuries about you know, yeah, on um, the behind. I mean, the behind the scenes with that. So I mean, that kind of gives a little bit more. You know how most folks here they look at stuff like that, like man, man, how you fell off like that, man? You, they don't even yeah. know how that stuff be going on. Um, but uh, th- again, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. I don't know if, if you want to add anything before AJ signs off. Well, I just want to thank you for joining us, man. Uh, supporting the podcast, and whenever football season starts back, man, you got to come on and talk some football with us because we'll have some football to talk about. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. I hope that he le- oh, no. <laughs> legally at that point talk about it. Oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> we were the enemy. We don't want to talk about yeah. Unless you unless you're gonna tell us how to beat them. <laughs> uh, we might be giving them some secrets or some, some inside information. Yeah, oh, we want that. you to keep uh-uh. your job, man. <laughs> I, I guess if you ever leave Florida and you're not working for Mississippi State, you know, wherever you at, man, you know, I just wish you well. You know, uh you one of my favorite Bulldog defenders, and I'm glad that we were able to get you on this show so we could you could share your journey uh with the Bulldog fans that watch this show. All right. Oh yeah, baby, go more, man. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> all right aj okay so i wanted to you know i didn't get to say anything so now i'm about to um do like ricardo and get on the soapbox uh, <laughs> fortunately for me i'm the host so nobody well i shouldn't have any technical difficulties like he had um <laughs> but i wanted to echo what um mr cheney said and invoke the words of great modern philosopher, Mr. Cornell Haynes Jr., where he said, what does it take to be number one? Because two is not a winner and three nobody remembers. And a lot of people talk about being the best and 
being at a high level, but a lot of times people don't know what it takes to actually do that. So I think that that's a good message that he's sending out to the kids that if you want to be at a high level, if you want to be at an elite level, then you have to be able to work at your craft. And, you know, it's like hard work, me luck, and then in some cases, hell, you can be good and have luck. And then, you know, things still don't pan out. But, you know, I believe that everybody ends up where they should be. So um, I would give a dad joke, but Jeremiah's cousin said that he don't like my dad jokes. But, you know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> no, Antoine, Antoine hey, Slim Cox said the same thing. <laughs> man, I don't know nobody even know who he is. So um, <laughs> I'm going to end this by saying this. If y'all don't like my dad jokes, then guess what? What do you call a show that doesn't belong to you? Not your show. Okay, that's it. <laughs> All right, go ahead and end this. I'm not, I'm not hosting the call, so Derek got to end it. <laughs> but.